Socialism is once again assuming a prominent place in our public discourse and political action uh, early in the 20th century. In the modern world, the last two or three centuries, socialism has been a perennial contender uh, as we in the modern world decided what was going to replace the feudalisms and empires that had um, dominated human history for millennia. Now, one of the issues, of course, is uh, socialism is a very broad concept, and uh, among socialists themselves, there's a great deal of disagreement and argument about what makes socialism socialism, and certainly all of socialism's enemies want to uh, offer their own definitions. Now, I want to uh, approach in this series podcast to let the socialists define socialism. I think if we're going to understand socialism, of course, there's a there's a, a hazard that if one is not initially su- uh, sympathetic to it, one will come up with a pejorative definitions or a slanting definition, and that risk can be alleviated by taking seriously what the socialists themselves have said they are advocating. But then again, since there are a thousand different versions of socialism, uh, some of them not significantly different from each other. There's still a follow-up issue of if we're going to sympathetically let socialists define the system that they are advocating, which socialists should we select? So this is what I have done. I'm going to uh, give you eight definitions, uh, quoting directly from the socialists involved. And I've chosen four who are intellectuals, but all of them are prominent intellectuals. You'll recognize the names if you know anything about the history of socialism. And I'm going to choose four politicians, uh, four activists, and uh, but activists who were successful at uh, coming to power on a socialist platform or a socialist agenda, then spending some actual time in power implementing their ideals. So that then is to say we'll bridge the theory and the practice gap. What do the socialist intellectuals say socialism is? What have the Uh, actually successful socialist politicians said that they were trying to do. I've also got some geographical diversity. I'm uh, going to quote from socialists from Germany, from France, uh, two from the United States, and then among the politicians, I'm going to quote one from Russia, one from China, one from Britain, and one from India. And that's another kind of diversity that we're going for. So then that's a number from Europe, a number from America, and a number from Asia as well. So the idea then is we'll let the socialists speak in their own voices. Uh, We'll look at both the theory side and the practical side, and we'll have a significant geographical diversity as well. So here are the eight. I'm going to uh, quote Karl Marx. Of course, he was German. Henri de Saint-Simon, a utopian socialist from France. Uh, Both of those are 19th century individuals. And then I'm going to quote from Robert Heilbrunner, probably the most uh, widely uh, regarded, respected socialist academic of the 20th century. And also another American, Michael Harrington of the United States, widely read socialist intellectual. Among the politicians, self-described socialists, I'm going to quote Vladimir Lenin from Russia, Mao Zedong from China, Clement Attlee from Britain, and Nehru from India. And all of these are individuals who are self-described socialists again, and uh, of course who are are, uh, giants in the history of socialism. Now, the eight quotations, I'm going to read them. I'll do a little bit of parsing and, uh, and uh, then uh, pulling out things that I think are significant in the quotation. But the ones uh, all speak to, in the first place, what the author's motivation for advocating socialism is. Why am I arguing for, for socialism? Why do I think it's good, noble, moral, better, whatever the, uh, the value is that we are seeking? Second, the quotations will illustrate what actions the socialists think are necessary to bring about socialism. And what what methods of implementation are they advocating? 
And then third, they uh, will, in most cases, speak to the future, what results they expect or what consequences they speak or expect, rather, uh, socialism to bring about. So we have intentions and or motivations. We have uh, actions or implementation steps. And then we have results and or consequences. And as I'm going through, of course, I'm going to uh, post all of these at the website so you can uh, check them out for yourself. But if you're keeping notes or thinking, a self kind of definition exercise for those interested in pursuing it. From these eight quotations, if these are all giants in the landscape, what common characteristics do you think best define socialism, taking these into account. All right, so I've got two here from uh, Karl Marx. Only uh, any list has to include him. So here we go. This is from his critique of the Gotha program of 1875. And his point is going to be that communism is the highest phase of socialism. Quote, in a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor, has vanished. After labor has become not only a means of life, but also life's prime want. After the productive forces have also increased with the all-round development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banner from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So a few things I will pull out here. Uh, one is the division of labor is uh, problematic. It's an enslaving subordination of the individual. So the division of labor needs to be gotten rid of. As Marx says, it will vanish. Productivity will increase significantly under socialism, and that will then enable us to totally transcend bourgeois right, or another word for the modern economy, perhaps capitalism, or free, perhaps free market liberalism, that we will be able to leave entirely behind, right, bourgeois capitalism. And then we have the moral slogan, right, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. That then is to say, we look at individuals and those who have the most ability will be contributing the most and it will be redistributed to those according to their needs. So this uh, latter part is the moral standard, right? Those who are able right, have an obligation, a social obligation to serve others according to their needs. So the fact that you have needs, that gives you a claim on society. And the fact that you have abilities, that means society has a claim on you. And a socialist society will be one that in its highest communist phase will uh, operate according to that Join world-renowned philosopher Dr. Stephen Hicks this March in Australia across a series of events in Brisbane and Melbourne as he navigates the mysterious cultural landscape of current-day political correctness and postmodernism, giving attendees his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Dr. Hicks will be hosting four events throughout March. He'll be doing evening talks in Brisbane and Melbourne and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 14th in Melbourne, where he will delve even deeper into how it's affecting our present and halting our drive for progress, as well as teaching you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com in your browser. Select the events to which you'd like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices with 20% off. While you're online, please leave a review for the podcast on your favorite media player. Now back to the podcast. All right, now, how do we get there, uh, given that we are currently in a bourgeois, capitalist, etc. society? And here's a quotation from 1848. The same year that Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto, Marx writing, quote, There is only one way in which the murderous death agonies of the old society and the bloody birth throes of the new society can be shortened, simplified, and concentrated. And that way is revolutionary 
terror, unquote. So to get from here to there, we uh, are going to need a certain amount of revolution, and revolution in an extreme degree, one that will evoke terror, and then murderous agonies, bloody, and so forth, are emphasized by by uh, Marx. So we have the moral standard, the uh, socialist vision that we're striving for, but violence and revolutionary terror are necessary to get there. All right, so that's one from Marx. Let's move on to Henri de Saint-Simon. He was a theoretician. And in this first, I've got two short quotations from him. The, uh, the first as a statement of the vision, and it's got somewhat religious authoritarian vision that Saint-Simon is articulating. So, quote, Anybody who does not obey the orders will be treated by the others as a quadruped. All men will work. They will regard themselves as laborers attached to one workshop whose efforts will be directed to guide human intelligence according to my divine foresight. The Supreme Council of Newton will direct their works. That's from an 1803 piece. I'll give the source again when the, this is published at the website. So the things to pull out here is uh, everyone has to work. If you don't, then you'll be treated as a quadruped, that is to say as a cow or some sort of uh, bovine creature. And it will be a matter of orders that will be directed by the Supreme Council of Newton. So here we have an indication that this is to be a rational, scientific, mechanical, and top-down kind of process. There's a hint, though, that uh, this is a somewhat religious vision because he calls it his divine foresight. So it is going to be guided by human intelligence. So orders coming from a top-down source that is a somewhat divinely inspired, but nonetheless scientific, uh, a central commanding order, and people will follow the orders, and they will, uh, seems to involve not very much mobility at all. As he says, you will be attached to one workshop. All right, now, uh, second, that's uh, the first one about, about the, the vision and the ultimate end uh, from the second quote. This is from an 1825 piece, uh, New Christianity. So Simone, Saint-Simon rather seems to be integrating socialism with a kind of modernized Christianity as he sees it. Quote, the whole of society ought to strive towards the amelioration of the moral and physical existence of the poorest class. Society ought to organize itself in the way best adapted for attaining this end, unquote. So first and foremost, our focus is on the poorest people in society, and all of society's resources should be organized with those individuals in mind. And there's a connection here to the previously quoted Marx quotation. Those will be satisfied according to their need. St. Simone is indicating that the poorest have the greatest needs, and so society, again, should direct all of its efforts toward those individual. All right, moving on uh, now to two 20th centuries. Here's uh, Robert Heilbrunner, a best-selling author of The Worldly Philosopher and a uh, self-described socialist professor of economics. This is from the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics. Quote, socialism defined as a centrally planned economy in which the government controls all means of production. All right, government controls everything, everything that is involved or relevant to the productive process, and the government then comes up with a planned economy, and it is a, a central institution. All of the rest of society takes its bearing from the center, and that is what socialism is. Now, on what methods are going to be required, here is Heilbrunner talking about how socialism, in this case, is contrasted, again, to bourgeois society and or capitalism or free markets. And he uh, invokes a new war economy as the, uh, the best metaphor to understand or the best analogy to understand socialist methods in terms of, quote, the creation of socialism as a new mode of production can properly be compared to the moral equivalent of war. War against the old order, in this case, the will need to amass and apply the power commensurate with the requirements of a massive war. 
This need not entail the exercise of command in an arbitrary or dictatorial fashion, but it certainly requires the curtailment of the central economic freedom of bourgeois society, namely the right of individuals to own and therefore to withhold, if they wish, the means of production, including their own labor." Unquote. So, the government owns everything, including the labor of the individual, and an individual, to the extent one has the capacity to produce, cannot withhold one's labor. And so, just as a conscript drafted for military purpose or one drafted for military purpose, you are owned by the society, and the, the, uh, the government can direct your efforts toward the, uh, the results that it deems necessary. All right, Michael Harrington, moving on to our fourth theoretician, socialist professor. He was also a founding member of the Democratic Socialists of America. And in his view, uh, socialism requires a kind of transcendent. It's a, it's, it's a transcendent vision that cannot be realized until we get past certain limitations currently trapping human beings in uh, less than optimal circumstances. So this is uh, what Harrington calls, quote, the vision of socialism itself, unquote. Quote, this is not an immediate program constrained by what is politically possible or even the projection of a middle distance in which structural changes might take place. It is the idea of an utterly new society in which some of the fundamental limitations of human existence have been transcended. Its most basic premise is that man's battle with nature has been completely won. And there is therefore more than enough of material goods for everyone. I'm going to pause the quotation right there. So that then is to say that for Harrington, we have to first, not through socialist means, completely uh, win our battle against nature and be in a position that the economy all by itself is more or less automatically going to be able to produce enough material goods for everyone. And only once that can we then, as socialists, focus on what socialists are really going to be interested in, and that is then to say, we don't have to worry about production. It's going to be a matter purely of distribution, according to socialist methods. Now, picking up the quotation again, quote, as a result of this unprecedented change in the environment, a psychic mutation takes place. Invidious competition is no longer programmed into life by the necessity of a struggle for scarce resources. Cooperation, fraternity, and equality become natural. In such a world, man's social productivity will reach such heights that compulsory work will no longer be necessary. And as more and more things are provided free, money, that universal equivalent of means by which necessities are rationed, will disappear. Unquote. So the argument then is that human psychology as it is is currently not suited for socialism because human psychology currently is directed by the needs to produce goods in a society where there's not enough to go around. And so all of the features of competition and uh, the urge to produce as a matter of necessity and so forth are necessary. Money as a means of allocating uh, resources and so forth is consequent is also built into our current psychological outlook. We want more money, we love money, and so forth. So the point then is once the productive problem has been completely solved, human psychology can be transformed, and it will be a psychology that no longer has competition, a feeling that one needs to work, an awareness that one is struggling about scarce resources, and that one is focused on money. So one can then be cooperative with other people, see everyone as one's brother and sister, and everybody is, uh, is equal, and all of this will be natural, and one will have no concerns about productive abilities or providing for one's material goods because everything is going to be provided freely. Once we have individuals with that psychology, then socialism can materialize. All right. Now, how are we going to get there? I have another quotation from Michael Harrington. The first one was from his big book called Socialism. This one is from a piece you know, published in Omni magazine, a kind of a popular science type magazine. 
And uh, here uh, Harrington is speaking about justice and character and totally rejecting capitalism's concept of justice and the idea that moral character should be defined in terms of any sort of self-responsibility uh, in a sense that you have to work for what you, what you get and that you should get uh, what you earn. Capitalists sometimes like to say you eat what you kill, that there's a fairness, that uh, the, the more and the better you work, the more productive you are, the more you have. Harrington arguing that that conception of justice will be totally rejected and replaced in socialism. So here's the quote. Quote, the ideal, the radical notion is to break the link between income and work that exists in the capitalist societies. To break the idea that what you receive is proportional to what you provide or give. In utopia, what you receive is what you need and what you give is what you can give. Unquote. All right, so that latter part is picking up and, and quite continuous with Karl Marx's uh, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And then picking up the quotation again, quote, the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing, education, medical are care are met in my utopia. Uh, I don't care if they are lazy, promiscuous, irreverent, rotten people. No one should have to go cold or hungry rather or cold, scoundrel or not. And in my utopia, I wouldn't change a single facet of human nature as we now know it." Unquote. So the idea then is under socialism, everyone's needs will be met. And that has nothing to do with one's character. It has nothing to do with one's actions, nothing to do with one's product. Activity. It's a guarantee. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claim that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now those are the four theor theoreticians. I'm going to now move on to Vladimir Lenin, obviously one of the most successful socialist revolutionaries of all time, and uh, for some years before his death, a ruler of the, the Soviet Union. So here's uh, Lenin, uh, very early in, uh, in his uh, coming to power, writing to the rural poor. This is from his collected works. And uh, saying now that he's come to power, what he sees socialism's goal as being. Quote, we want to achieve a new and better order of society. In this new and better society, there must be neither rich nor poor. All will have to work. All right, unquote for a moment. Uh, again, noticing the common theme from the earlier theoretician quote, uh, people, all will have to work. You must work as a matter of, of order. Picking up the quotation again. Not a handful of rich people, but all the working people must enjoy the fruits of their common labor. Machines and other improvements must serve to ease the work of all and not to enable a few to grow rich at the expense of millions and tens of millions of 
people. Stopping the quote again for a moment, Lenin indicating that we are good with technology, uh, we are good with uh, mechanization of the economy. Of course, we uh, were then in favor of the fruits of the Industrial Revolution, but what we want is a more egalitarian distribution of those fruits. Picking up the quotation again, this new and better society is called socialist society. The teachings about this society are called socialism, unquote. Now, the second one, if that's the vision, how are we going to get there again? So here's Lenin on socialism's methods again in 1917, quote, the state is an instrument for coercion. We want to organize violence in the name of the interests of the workers, unquote. Quote. So again, continuous with, uh, with orders, coercion, top-down command, and even violence is, uh, is necessary to get there. In 1920, a few years later, after there had been some pushback against Lenin and the Bolsheviks for their uh, rather brutal methods, Lenin saying, quote, a good communist is at the same time a good Czechist, unquote. And the Cheka were the secret police of the early Soviet Union, noted for their uh, uh, very violent methods on behalf of the state. All right, so again, we have a continuity with uh, violence, terror, and uh, and so on. Now we'll move on to Mao Zedong, another extraordinarily successful socialist revolutionary and for many years chairman of the Communist Party of China. And here's Mao uh, on socialism's productivity and arguing in 1956 that uh, socialism will be much more economically productive than capitalism or, or free market bourgeoisie type uh, uh, industry. Quote, socialist revolution aims at liberating the productive forces. The changeover from individual to socialist collective ownership in agriculture and handicrafts and from capitalist to socialist ownership in private industry and commerce is bound to bring about a tremendous liberation of the productive forces. Thus, the social conditions are being created for a tremendous expansion of the industrial and agricultural production." Unquote. So socialism is bound to be a much more economically productive way of doing the economy, but what it's going to require is getting away from any sort of individual and going in a collectivistic, socialistic direction and getting away from capitalist ownership, which involves private property, to socialist ownership, which of course requires collective ownership uh, and on behalf of the collective, the government management of the productive forces. Now, a quotation again from Mao, if that's the, the ends and the hope and future of socialism, well, how are we going to get there? And here is uh, Mao arguing, quote, socialism must have a dictatorship. I'm going to repeat that. Socialism must have a dictatorship. It will not work without it, unquote. All right, moving to the West, uh, quotation from Clement Attlee, who was a socialist and prime minister of the United Kingdom for some years. This is uh, from a book he contributed to called The Labour Party in Perspective, published by the Left Book Club in 1937. And here's the quotation uh, indicating what he takes to be capitalism's evils and how public ownership is the remedy. Quote, Socialism is not the invention of an individual. It is essentially the outcome of economic and social conditions. The evils that capitalism brings differ in intensity in different countries, but the root cause of the trouble once discerned, the remedy is seen to be the same by thoughtful men and women. The cause is the private ownership of the means of life. The remedy is public ownership, unquote. All right, so certainly, yes, capitalism, free markets are individualistic, and they involve private ownership of the means of life. Of course, that's your body and uh, the fruits of your labor and the tools uh, and the capital goods that one would use. And so the idea then is all of those should be owned publicly, and that is what socialism is all about. 
All right, and then one more quotation. This is from Nehru, another socialist uh, who became the prime minister of India upon its achieving independence in the late 1940s. And what in this quotation uh, Nehru is doing is indicating socialism's central planning, but arguing that it's going to be universal. It's the same kind of socialism that all of the socialists around the world are talking about and have been talking about historically, and here indicating also that he thinks that it is a rational and a scientific approach against the kind of chaos and emotionalism and anarchy that is characteristic of individualistic and free market types of society. Quote, we have accepted the socialist and cooperative approach, the planned and scientific approach to economic development in preference to the individual enterprise of the old laissez-faire school. Planning and development have become a sort of mathematical problem which may be worked out scientifically. It is extraordinary how both the Soviet and American experts agree on this." Unquote. Yeah, and since certainly we can then say the Soviet planners under Lenin and Stalin and so forth, the American experts uh, already in the first half of the 20th century who are socialists are doing the same sort of thing. So he's arguing that it's not unique to him in South Asia. This is uh, uh, in Eastern Europe and all the way across the sea in America. All right, picking up the quotation again. If a Russian planner comes here, studies our projects and, advising us, and advises us, it is really extraordinary how his conclusions are in agreement with those of, say, an American expert. The moment the scientist or technologist comes to the scene, be he Russian or American, the conclusions are the same for the simple reason that planning and development today are almost a matter of mathematics." Unquote. So socialism is rational, scientific. It is the wave of the future, and it's going to be universal. The same socialist methods will be used the world over. Uh, because they apply for all human beings solving the same sorts of economic problems that we have. And clearly what we need to do is reject individualism, reject private property, reject laissez-faire. All right, so that's eight figures. Uh, geographical diversity, quite significant. Historical diversity uh, ranging from early 1800s all the way through to late 1900s as well, so 200, cent, uh, 200 years rather of socialist thought, and also uh, making a point of looking at socialist activists who have actually become politicians and put their views into practice, as well as the leading socialist thinkers. So what I want to do is uh, use this as a basis for a bigger project, which is then to say, if we're going to have arguments about socialism, uh, the first thing we need to do is, if we're going to be productive in these arguments, is have an agreement about what we are talking about. And so what uh, those of us who are unsympathetic to socialism should be able to do is read these uh, uh, definitions that are offered, sift through them, and figure out what they have in common, and then uh, sympathetically construct a definition of socialism that for open-minded, rational socialists who are true believers would nonetheless agree, yes, that is what we are talking about. And then the next thing, of course, would be for the socialists uh, to give their arguments in favor of it, and then for those who are uh, anti-socialist to make sure that the arguments they bring to bear do in fact bear on the definition and account that the socialists are offering. And that's what future podcasts in the series will return to. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time, and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favorite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher. <laughs>